We are going to circle back today um, a little bit. There are things that I, one, things that I need to correct that I postulated last week that are not right. Um, so, yeah. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about them. But there are also some other things that uh, as I w went back and I reviewed some things, I noticed that, hey, it would have been nice to say this or it would have been nice to, to describe this or talk about this. So we're going we're gonna to look at a few of those. As I was looking into this, uh, we're going to go back to the transfiguration, which again is still Matthew 17. It's just the beginning of Matthew 17. Um, we endeavored to kind of describe that metamorphic state. I don't even know if that's a word, metamorphic, but that metamorphosis that, that Jesus had in the transfiguration when he took on a, a, a different form, a different persona. Uh, this isn't, um, it wasn't just a subtle change. It was more like the um, caterpillar to the butterfly kind of change. That's the significant change that, that we should think of when we think of this, this change, this trans transfiguration, um, transformation. But what, one thing that I came across that gave me pause was one gentleman said that he thinks that Jesus transformed state was what his body would look like in perfect humanity. I had to think about that, but the way he described it, think about Adam and Eve before the fall. We don't necessarily know what their bodily form looked like at that time. Uh, we do know there was some sort of change, whether it was a cognitive mental change or cognitive and physical change, some sort of change when they partook of the fruit because they looked at each other and went, oh, we're naked. So there was some recognition or change in form that occurred. And so it was just interesting. You know, this guy postulated the idea that Jesus would have possibly taken on what we ourselves would look like if we were back in the garden in that perfect human state initially created. Because if you think about it, God created us in his likeness. We don't know what that looks like necessarily. So it's just an idea, it's just a thought this gentleman threw out and, and it gave me pause for thought. I was like, okay, yeah, we don't know. But it's worth talking about, it's worth mentioning. Um, because we know, and, and I said this last week, if Jesus was taken, had taken on his full radiant glory, there's no way that Peter, James, and John could have witnessed it. They couldn't have seen it. Spontaneous combustion. Um, so, it's an interesting idea that's a, yeah, huh, I don't know. Something I'll carry with me, though, as we move along. We also talked about why Moses and Elijah, if you think about <clears throat> what just happened in Matthew 16, Peter gave his great declaration, his great proclamation, confession, we might say, that Jesus is Messiah. In the Jewish experience, the Hebrew experience, <clears throat> for a testimony to be confirmed, to be legit, how many witnesses were required? Witnesses were required. At least two. So, there needed to be confirmation that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of the living God. What we see in the Transfiguration event was two very legitimate witnesses in Moses and Elijah. Not only that, but at the toward the end of the experience, God himself made the profession. This is my son 
in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So he made the profession that Peter made, essentially. God made it. Moses and Elijah were there as witnesses, in addition to Peter, James, and John. So it was kind of from the Judaic or the Hebrew experience, it was necessary to validate, this, this transfiguration experience was necessary to validate for Peter, James, and John what had been said, what had been believed. Uh, so that's another reason, I think, we talked last week a little bit about, you know, why Moses, why Elijah, but that's another reason why we might see the two of them there, because they were the most legitimate witnesses you might be able to, to find in the Jewish experience. Steve also asked the question last week about whether or not Moses and Elijah were the two prophets that we read about in Revelation. Uh, I, think, <clears throat> I think that we are intended to believe they are. And I say it that way because I do not know, and it's a big study to go there, whether or not the two prophets discussed in Revelation are figurative or whether they're literal. If you go to Revelation 9, I'm sorry, Revelation 11. Revelation 11, it talks about these two witnesses that are going to... Um, Well, actually, it calls them prophets, and they're going to witness to the end of the world or, or the, the beginning of the kingdom. <clears throat> but we see, it says, uh, long about, verse 3, I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for a certain number of days. They are two olive trees and two lampstands. They stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. And so here's, this is why I'm, I'm saying could be literal, could be figurative. That in itself is a whole other study. I don't really want to approach that. But notice this right here, verse 6. They have the power, okay, to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. If you recall, that is exactly what Elijah did. Elijah called for a drought. And he said, it's not going to rain until I call on God and, and ask, it to, you know, ask for him to send rain. So Elijah called for a drought. I have the, the verse here if you really would like to have it. I think it would be good to have. Um, Well, I do have the verse here somewhere. See, I have notes, and then I have notes. I'm trying to go by these notes, but, you know, when I get off of that... <laughs> right. First Kings 17, 1. Elijah called for drought. Uh, in, in fact, Elijah, what we read about Elijah is actually very short in, in the Bible. The first Kings, it's only like three, four, five chapters. It's, it's a pretty short section, but it's a pretty significant section. And Elijah carries a lot of weight in the Jewish experience. Uh, and, and he is considered foremost in the prophets. Uh, some of it is because of the prophecy that he will come again before the Messiah. Uh, and some of it is just because of the experience that he brought to the Jews during his time of prophecy. Um, so, and we talked a little bit about that last week. But, reading on in verse 6, in Revelation chapter 11, so we have what seems to be Elijah, and then it says, and they have the power to turn waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, who does that sound like? Moses. Moses. So I believe we are led to understand that these two witnesses, these two prophets are in some form or fashion Elijah and Moses. And I say in some form or fashion because, we, and we talked really briefly last week, Moses and Elijah were emblematic of the law and the prophets. 
So what could be said here in, in its reflection of Moses and Elijah is all of the law and all of the prophets testify. Okay. So we could read it that way. But to validate where Steve was going last week, absolutely, I think we're intended to, to understand that these, these two individuals, Moses and Elijah, were the two prophets that are discussed in, in Revelation. Um, let's see. What else? Here's where I went awry last week. Moses' body. I postulated last week, I threw out the idea that what if Moses didn't really die? Remember me talking about that? Well, he did. <laughs> okay, he did. Um, and, and we know he did because if you were already in Revelation, just a few pages to the left in the book of Jude, there's only one chapter, the book of Jude, verse 9, talks about the archangel Michael having a disagreement with Satan, with the devil, about the body of Moses. Okay? So, we don't know what that disagreement was about. We don't know if Michael was dispatched to collect Moses' body or if he was dispatched to protect Moses' body or if he was simply asked to bury Moses' body. But in some sense, he had a disagreement with Satan directly about Moses' body. So, the first part of what I want to say is, forget what I said last week about the possibility that he might not have died. <laughs> and I told you last week, it's just me kind of throwing ideas out. So, we're correcting that this week. <laughs> Those ideas weren't right. Now, it's interesting to me where Jude came up with this. You know, how does Jude, you know, it says in, in, in Deuteronomy that no one knows where um, Moses was buried. But here in Jude, we have this idea that seems common because he didn't argue the point. He didn't, he didn't say, I was told this by God. He didn't say, he just threw it out there like it's common knowledge that Michael had a tussle with the devil about Moses' body. Where did that come from? It seems that there was a, a book, a writing that was current at the time. We would call it apocryphal. Remember the word apocryphal? It basically meant outside the scope of our, our canon, our authorized writings. It was also a, a pseudo, pseudepigraphal work. Basically, it was written in the name of Moses, but Moses didn't write it. Okay. It's called the Assumption of Moses. And we have very, very, very minimal bits and pieces of that particular document today. What we do have doesn't mention this. But we do know that there are church fathers in, in the 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries that discuss this book. So the only thing we really have to go on is what they have said about this book and that this is probably a reference to that book. But the idea is, gleaned from this book, that Moses, was, I'm sorry, that Michael was sent to protect the body of, of Moses. But Satan wanted the body to dispose of it in his own way. Uh, let me see before I go too far. It's a Jewish tradition, yes, that Michael was sent to either bury or protect or deliver. Okay. Could be any of those things. Moses' body. I think possibly it was deliver. My personal opinion. And again, my opinion, just throwing it out there. <laughs> but why, why was it important to be delivered? Well, we see Moses again in his transfigured bodily state here. So at some point in time, there had to be some sort of special delivery of Moses to the gates of heaven. Um, and so possibly that was it. Now, I'm not going to you know, lick and stick it because... 
all of this is based on a document that we don't even have anymore and, and it was not maintained because it was not counted as authoritative back then and so we can't say well they didn't know what they were talking about anyway interesting stuff it's also interesting as I was getting into this thinking about Michael there are so many things going on in the spiritual realm that we're just not in touch with. You know, if you read the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel talked to Gabriel. And then there's a, an episode, some people believe it was Gabriel, but Daniel also talked to a being um, who was detained by the prince of Persia for three weeks, for 21 days. I, w I, I intended to come to you. I wanted to, I, you prayed and I was sent and I wanted to come to you. But for 21 days, I was detained by the prince of Persia. But then Michael, the archangel, came and helped me out. And so now I'm able to be here. So, ooh, what is going on in the world? I, you know, Paul said, the fight we fight is not flesh and blood. I don't think we really grapple with enough, understand enough the things that are happening in that realm that we can't see. Yeah. I don't know if you were going here, so I apologize. But the, uh, you talk about the body of Moses. I was aware that there was some divergence between the two. There's another place where it's mentioned the names of the two magicians. Yes. Also not uh, recorded in earlier scripture. But if all scripture is inspired by God and that appears to be stated as a fact, I've always taken it as a fact. Yeah. That it's critical to our salvation to know that one. But uh, what do you think of that about the body of Moses? It says he died and, and all of that. And all scripture is inspired by God. Does that. It says he died. It... Well, what I mean is. Um, the account of Moses' death being a literal death and everything associated with it. Yeah. Wouldn't the fact that it's stated as a fact in here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the question I would, I would pose, and, and, and I agree, and that's why I made that correction today. I think he did die. Um, I posed it that he didn't last week. But the, the reason I... Sometimes I say things because I th I'm trying to think of things that are not taken absolutely literally. I think we get ourselves in trouble when we read something that is an inspired text, but we read it with our uninspired, common, current understandings. And so there are times when I try to reach outside of that and say well am I really thinking of this right maybe I am but what if I'm not what would it look like if I'm not now that could take us down the completely wrong path and we have to pray and we have to rely on the spirit that the spirit guides and there are times when I can tell you I think I've come up with things on my own that have been validated by other people after I've been researching it I'm like oh well yeah I thought that oh, how cool is that 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 worked that way and then there are things that I've thought, like this one, that as I research it further, I go, well, that was a stupid thought. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and, and a lot of that stupid thought is because, and, and I knew about the passage in Jude. I just didn't remember it. Um, and so it's just because I have either forgotten or am not called to, to mind those specific passages that would tie it together. Um, but absolutely, I do believe it's inspired and I do believe it's real, it's true. But what is, what we understand to be true may not be the correct understanding. And I think it's, it's very precarious when we sit there and we say it's absolutely this way because it says so. Well, if we say that, then Herod was a fox. Because Jesus called Herod a fox. And if we're going to be exact, you know, truly literal, you know, we have to start understanding how the words were used. Um, and, and we're going to get into that in Matthew 24. There are some phrases that are used that I don't believe we should take literally 
because we'll look back at some Old Testament uh, places where the same phrases were used for different experiences for different people. And so we have to think through, okay, how does that apply then in that circumstance? If we were to take that application and place it in Matthew 24, what does that look like in Matthew 24? Oh, okay. So if we understand that, what does that mean for us? Does it mean anything for us? Okay, so, so we have to really kind of think through the way that they used the language and the way that they talked. And we talked just, uh, you know, the last few weeks about phraseology, phrases that we use that some people don't understand. Uh, and so we have to really kind of be cautious about that. Yeah. You know, there are various reasons. I don't know. Uh, it could be that just you, he wanted to claim victory over... The question was, why would Satan want the body of Moses? He, maybe he wanted to claim victory over Moses because Moses sinned. Um, and, and a lot of people point back to, uh, there's a place in the Old Testament where, I, I think it's uh, Zechariah, it's one of those places, where Joshua, the, the, the high priest Joshua, is presented to God in very dirty clothes, very sinful appearance. And Satan is standing there and, and judging him. And God says, you know, I rebuke you, Satan, you know, and put good clothes on him. Um, basically, there's forgiveness here. There's cleansing here. Um, and so a lot of people kind of point to some of that in this experience and in and, and some of the experiences that, that follow. Um, so it could be that Satan just wanted to claim another soul, claim another body. What is more likely, well, it seems more likely to my human mind, I should say, is if the Israelites knew a location of where Moses might lay, you know, humanity has this propensity to make certain things special. And so they would have, you know, they, the brazen serpent that Moses made. We find out later that the Israelites were worshiping that serpent, you know, worshiping that cane, that stake that Moses made. Because it was a special thing uh, in, in their her heritage, their life. So if they knew where Moses was, where his body lay they could have made a mausoleum to him and then all of a sudden be praying to Moses and you know they could have really gone awry by paying too much homage to Moses in that way um, so the thought is God didn't want that to happen but Satan sure did because that would sure be a good way to knock God's people off of their path which he found other ways to do that but uh, so that that's the that's the current thought as to why Satan would have wanted Moses' body. Okay, another thing about Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses died and was buried. Elijah was raised to he heaven in a cloud. Jesus died and was buried. And yet Jesus was also raised to heaven in a cloud. So some interesting parallels. Whether they're meaningful or not, I can't tell you. But it's interesting to think about. Okay, so you have those two experiences in Moses and Elijah. And Jesus himself is going to experience both of those. Tabernacles. We talked about why Peter would build a tabernacle or, or even come up with the idea of building tabernacles. We still don't know, and I, and I stay with what I said last week about that. But the Aramaic version of the New Testament, and I've mentioned before that it's possible that Matthew wrote in Aramaic before the Greek version came about. But the Aramaic version is called the uh, Pasita. And the way that it says, um, you know, when Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let me build three tabernacles. The Aramaic version basically says, 
Lord, it is good for us to remain here. Well, that might give a little more glimmer into why Peter was expecting that these tabernacles were a good idea, these booths, these places to stay. You know, I want to stay here. I want to camp here. This is an awesome experience. We need, to, we need to make this last. So again, whether we make something of the Aramaic scripture or not, whether or not that translation was correct or not, it does give us a little bit more uh, insight into the possibilities of what was going on in Peter's head. You know, Lord, it's good that we remain here. It's better that we remain here. Something that we can apply in the whole experience or a whole um, out of the whole uh, section is this idea of mountaintop experiences. When we are, when we experience something that we just feel enveloped in God, or we're a part of a group who's worshiping together uh, and, and experiencing positive things with God, we call those mountaintop experiences, right? And what do we call it when we have to go back to our daily life? Going back to the valley. Yeah, going back to the old grind. Going back to the valley. <clears throat> Peter thought, hey, let's do these tabernacles. And God says, no. He didn't say no, but he basically cut him off and said, Peter, you're going the wrong direction. You know, kind of gives us this, this implication. Because I need you to go back down the mountain. Okay. You were here for a purpose. Now, carry that purpose with you. That purpose was to understand the real identity of Jesus. We've got confirmation. We've got witnesses. We've got testimony. We've got God speaking. Carry that with you. Hold that in your heart. Because you're going to need it when you get back down the mountain. And we're the same way. We can't always stay on the mountain. We need those mountaintop experiences. But we can't stay there. We've got to come back down to the valley because there are people who need us in the valley. The coming of Elijah. Elijah. The verses, you know, when, when they come down off the mountain or are coming off the mountain and they say, you know, all this is great, but why do the Jewish leaders tell us that Elijah has to come first? And Jesus says, indeed, Elijah will come first. In fact, our version, our, our Greek versions usually say it this way. Um, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. <clears throat> That's kind of hard to articulate what does that mean because then he turns around and says oh but I tell you Elijah already did come if we read the Aramaic version oh I'm really liking that Aramaic version today aren't I if we read the Aramaic version this is what it says if I, let me see if I can find it here tabernacles coming of Elijah okay it says that Jesus answered and said to them Elijah does come first so that everything might be fulfilled. Not indeed Elijah will come to restore. See, in our heads, in our English grammar, we think, oh, future Elijah will come and that coming will restore. Well, what he might have actually said was, indeed, it's true that Elijah comes first. Because then it kind of, it, it doesn't cause dissonance with, but I tell you, Elijah did already come first. Yes, he comes first. And Elijah did already come. And he comes in fulfillment of everything. In fulfillment of the prophecy. If you remember in Malachi chapter 4, it's the prophecy of Elijah, that Elijah would, would come. And so all the leaders and the teachers latched onto that. And so they often would say something like, um, everything could be left until Elijah comes. So they anticipated the coming of Elijah and they anticipated the coming of Elijah prior to the Messiah. Well, <laughs> in a way, it's almost like they are saying, well, we can just let things be the way they are until Elijah comes and then we got to get it right. Then we got to clean up our act. But 
Jesus says, yes, it's true. He confirms the teaching. It's true that Elijah comes first. He has to come to fulfill all things. Fulfill what? Well, the prophecies. The prophecies about Elijah coming first. But those prophecies have already been fulfilled. They have been fulfilled in the coming of John the Baptist. You know, he, he's, tell, he's talking to them about this. And, and Matthew tells us, oh, then they understood that he was actually talking about John the Baptist. So it's interesting the way that that reads. Uh, if you th think through or, or go back to the Aramaic versions, the Peshitta versions, it kind of brings a little more light to what was really being said. The Greek sometimes doesn't translate it quite as well. So I just wanted to kind of bring that out. We are now <laughs> at the new section. Don't worry, I won't keep you as late as I did last week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if we like it, that's good. Um, Raphael the painter, the artist. His last biggest work, now he didn't actually finish the work, his students finished the work, but a, a, we believe a big part of his work was done by him, by himself. But his last greatest work was called the temptation, I'm sorry, the, the transfiguration of Christ. The transfiguration. If you see this piece of art, it's basically two panels or two events going on in this transfiguration uh, art. The top section or the top half of this art is the episode that we read about in the transfiguration of Jesus. And so you have Jesus in radiant glory and then you have Moses and Elijah. Moses has the tablet. Elijah has the, the books of the prophet. Um, and, and they're kind of floating in the air um, and then you have Peter, James, and John cowering, looking up uh, in awe. And, and so you have this glorified image of, of Jesus in this top half. In the bottom half, you have what's going on in the valley below. When they come off the mountain, we start reading about the other disciples and a crowd and religious leaders and a de demon-possessed boy and his dad. There is chaos below. The disciples can't cure the boy. The religious leaders are, well, they're in, our, somehow the crowd is in argument. The dad is at a loss for words because the disciples can't cure the boy. The boy is distraught, um, possessed. And so you get this picture, you get this idea in this painting of two worlds. One of glory, one of honor, one of power, and one of sin and confusion and frustration and disappointment and if you step back far enough, you see how one is for the other and the other is for the one. People need that glory and, and power and honor of Jesus. And Jesus' witness is for the people. It was just an interesting just just juxtaposition. I like how Raphael did it. Now, was the timing correct? Did they actually occur at the very same time? Probably not. But we have in the, in in Matthew 17 these two pictures, and Raphael has put these two images in our, in our heads together in this one frame. It's very interesting, and it also is reflective of Moses. When Moses was on the mountain, because Moses was in this awesome experience with God, what was happening down below? That's right. That's right. According to Aaron, they just threw gold in the fire and poof, the calf came out. But there was, there was 
dishonor, there was sin, uh, sin, there was disenchantment, there was disobedience going on below while Moses was up on the mountain with God. So it's interesting that this Matthew 17 picture mimics in a lot of ways what we read in Exodus about what was going on at Mount Sinai at that time. I find that curious. Yeah, yeah, the Israelites would, yeah, they excuse their behavior. And, you know, to be honest, we're really hard on people of the past. We really are. As we read the Bible, we're like, duh, what were you thinking? But it's so easy. We got 2020 hindsight, you know. It's so easy for us to look back and go, well, that was stupid. I would not like to have my life laid out for everybody. Can you imagine? Yeah. Who wants their life exposed in the same way? Hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um. I don't know that I want to actually start into this yet, because uh, I have a problem about getting half, getting part way in, and then I feel like I need to finish it. <laughs> and if I finish it, we will definitely go quite a bit later than normal. Um, but I, I think we, as I would, I would invite us as we approach this next section to think about ourselves in that circumstance and how we fit in that same picture. Uh, we can go ahead and read it, but we won't extrapolate anything out of it until next week because it's just going to be a, a little bit more than we want to tackle today. But chapter 17, starting in verse 14, When they came to the crowd, a man approached... Now, who's they? Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Okay. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. Some of your other translations may say something a little different there. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving, this is Jesus, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? You know when people say things twice, especially in the Bible, that's like serious business. And Jesus is like, seriously, how long do I have to put up with this? Really? How long do I have to put up with this? I mean, he's like affirming it twice. Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Some of your versions might actually have a verse 21. If it does, mine doesn't, so I can't really read it verbatim, but it basically says, say again? It skips 21. Most of your versions will skip 21 because it is the understanding that that particular verse is not in the better of the original writings. It's in some of the original writings, but it's not in all of the original writings. So what will often happen is they will make a note of it and say, we're not sure if this is legitimately part of what Matthew wrote or if it was added later. So some people think it was added later. However, Mark does have it. Um, the Aramaic passages have it. So it is, it is probable that, it, that Jesus did say it, but because it's not in the early, some of the early Greek manuscripts, it's left out. But what is left out is Jesus says, but this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. And some ministers really like the fact that that was left out because that's kind of hard to, to talk about. 
This kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. We won't go into it today because we're out of time. But we will definitely talk about it next week. Think, though, if you were in the crowd, just one of the people in the crowd, what would you think? How would you experience this? Think also if you were the boy's father. How would you experience this? What would it mean to you? Think about if you were the disciples. Now, remember, the disciples had been given power to exercise demons. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. But now they can't do it. So if you were one of his disciples, how would you feel about what's going on? What does that mean to you? Uh, yeah, this is why they ask why, right? Hey, how come we couldn't do that? And then if you're Peter, James, and John, <laughs> you guys are wimps. Now, <laughs> now, how would you, you know, look at what's going on anyway? Well, we we want to tell you about what we just saw. Oh, not supposed to. <laughs> so, as you think through this, now we will also next week read the same experience in Mark. Because Mark extrapolates a little bit more. He gives it a little more detail, makes it a little more juicy. But there is a phrase, or, or a conversation, I should say. There's a conversation that Mark documents that I think is important in our experience. In Mark, the, the dad asks Jesus to heal the son if you can. And Jesus says, if you can? What is this? No. He says, if you have a belief, you can do anything, or anything can happen. I don't really want to deal too much with that, because that's a very, that has been taken too far by a lot of, of too many people. But what I really, really, really want, like and want to hone in on is what the Father says. Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Because I think we, more often than not, sit right there. So we want to talk about that. We, I like the way Mark puts it, and, and we want to kind of chew on that a little bit next week as well. Um, and then hopefully next week, I, ha I see no reason that we can't finish the chapter next week, honestly, because unless... Unless I do a lot more study and come up with some more interesting, juicy stuff. No, that, I honestly thought we were going to finish it this week. But uh, I don't see any reason we can't finish it next week. But there's a few other nuggets even past this story in, in Chapter 17. So we'll, we'll discuss that next week. And um, let's check on some of the people that, that aren't here and um, see if they need any help. Definitely, if they need prayers. We'll, uh, we'll pick it up there. Let's pray. Lord, we, in some small fashion, understand how proud you are of your son. And as you spoke on that mountaintop, this is my beloved son. I am so pleased with him. Listen to him. Help us, Lord, to truly focus on him, to magnify him, because he truly is the reason that we have any hope for salvation, for life with you eternally. Thank you, Father, for that gift I thank you Jesus for that gift and help us to uh, live for you in all that we do and, and, and forgive us Lord when we fail when we stumble when we fall we pray that uh, you give us strength and focus to stand back up and to carry on 
And that uh, even in the, the failing, we're able to shine your light. Not because of who we are and all that we're able to accomplish, but because of who your son is, who Jesus is, and what he already accomplished that gave us the ability to stand back up and to carry on. Thank you, Father, for that gift. Thank you, Father, for the time we have to share together. And thank you for the love that we have for each other. And uh, we especially, Lord, thank you for salvation, the eternity that, that is ours because of your Son. It's in him we pray. Amen.